Inland from the sea in the northern island of New Zealand lies a desert plateau. From this plateau rise giant volcanic mountains, and from these mountains flow many rivers. For generations, the Maoris have told of gods who dwell in these mountains and of the legend of the Whanganui River. The Maoris say many mountains once stood here, and one of these was Taranaki. But isolated from his brothers, Mount Taranaki now stands far away beside the Western Sea. And the path of his journey from the center of the island down to the sea is marked by the deep gorges of the Whanganui River. The river begins high in the mountains, but to the Maori people it begins in the mists that swirl around the peaks and along the valleys. It begins in the mists in the sky above. In ancient times, there stood at Taupo, in the center of this island, a group of powerful mountains. Greatest of these was Tongariro. His wife was Pihanga, whom Tongariro tenderly sheltered from the east and west wind. One day, the mountain Taranaki fell in love with Pihanga, and the other mountain guards were angry and spouted flame and smoke. The thunder god growled at Taranaki, and there were dancing lights in the sky. The mountains threw up fumes of vapor, and the mists caught fire. Hurried from his angry brothers, he left a deep scar in the earth. And from caverns deep in the volcanic cones, there welled forth a thousand springs, healing the scar left by Mount Taranaki's departure. And the snow gods sent down a thousand streams, the Arawata and the Ahu Ahu, the Tangahoe and Tangarakau, Rakura and Rataruki the Mangamingi and the Huacapapanui. Down from the foothills and across the plain, a thousand springs and a thousand streams rushing to fill a river. snow and mountain springs, the river speaks. River of legend called Whanganui that the Maoris use as a water highway. Along the valley of the Whanganui once lived thousands of brown-skinned men. Maoris of the tribes of Ngapairangi and Ngapamoana. They came in the great Polynesian migrations of the 13th century.
For 200 miles, the Whanganui flows westward, down the traditional pathway of the ancient god Taranaki, through uninhabited hills and dense bush valleys where the river seems to lose its way, where mists linger long after the early morning's first warmth reaches the valleys, and where birds, the tuis and coromicos, sing all day in giant tree ferns and tall matites. river was theirs. Its bush, its birds and fish, its deep refreshing waters. To all Maoris, the Whanganui was a common highway leading to the plains of the interior and a pathway down to summer fishing camps by the sea. For centuries, the tribes of Aotea daydreamed on its waters, listening to the song of the Tui studying every leaf and fern and weaving legends around the whirlpools and rapids of the enchanted river. When did you leave so much in me? In the gloom of the river forest, in dark caves, live the mythical Maori Taniwas and Ngangaras, the reptiles and land dragons. He came and made his lair in a cave that winds far into the cliffside. He's 12 feet long with a tail like a twitter. No one goes into this cave, though a tohunga armed with a proper karakia could enter. But these incantations have long been forgotten and the bush creeps back over the marae and around the deserted meeting houses. On cliff tops along the river, these are all that remain of the Maoris who have gone. In the river below, the broken canoes. Up the river came the white man and with the white man came red nightcaps, razor blades and rifles. And with rifles, tribal wars became deadlier. Some Maoris fought Pākehā, and the river ran with blood. But within a generation, the war drums that echoed down the gorges had gone. The bush was felled and burnt, and gave way to grassland for cattle and sheep. Sheltered valleys and rising slopes above the river proved ideal for stock. The ancient hunting and cultivating grounds of the Maori disappeared. Every summer out of the shearing sheds comes the Whanganui wool clip on its journey to the river mouth. In settlements along the banks live the Maoris left on the river, farming sheep and cattle. 
and over their old canoe routes travel the wool-laden steamers. Steamers now ply where once Maori warriors swept along in 100-man canoes. And to the bush valleys come tourists from other lands, speeding through rapids and rock-bound gorges under the sure hand of a Maori helmsman. The Whanganui flows out from the hills across the flats towards the coast. Soon the river deepens. Ahead lies the river mouth city of Whanganui, meeting place for town and country. Here live the people of the coast who serve the town and farming district. Shopkeepers and freezing workers, wool brokers and shipping agents. Men with a stake in the river, as the Maori had when he fished for eels and hunted in the bush that stood on these banks a century ago. The narrow gorges have gone and on the coastal flats, wool stores and cold storage buildings hold beef, mutton and butter awaiting shipment to the other side of the world, to Britain, America, France and Russia. Signs and signals beckon ships in from the sea. The river is hardly a river any longer. Behind the port lies the coastal town of Whanganui, and here, working alongside the Pākehā, are the river Māoris of today. Some wearing their army berets from Tunisia and El Alamein. But now the river hurries no more, and beyond lies the sea. And the Earth Mother sends out her river out into the western sea, into the hands of the sea god Tangaroa. And the winds of the ocean take these waters to where sea meets sky and gives them back to the heavens, where dwells the Sky Father, from whom these waters first came. 